midst of a, a series of lessons uh, that I've entitled Questions That Want Biblical Answers. And so uh, I'm hopeful that, uh, that you have enjoyed the series so far. Uh, last time we were taking a look at, um, at a, uh, a study on Is God Active in the World? And uh, we took a look at, uh, it was kind of, it, it, it's kind of a two-part study. Uh, one of the parts has to do with uh, uh, the question about whether there are charismatic gifts in the world. By that I mean miraculous gifts. Uh, and we had um, talked about what the difference is between a miracle and providence. So, what's a miracle? How good of a teacher was I? Crickets. Oh, man. <laughs> what is a miracle? What's a good definition for a miracle? It's a supernatural event. It's a supernatural event. Um, and, and more to the point, more specifically, it is a supernatural event that is a suspension of the laws of nature. Um, to, once again, to illustrate... Uh, the only time that any of us can walk on water is when the lake is frozen. That's when we can walk on water. But to walk on liquid water, Jesus did that. Peter did that for a while, and then he sunk, of course. He doubted. <laughs> he doubted, and he sunk. Uh, but the point, very simply, is that that, that was a suspension of laws of nature. Uh, when Israel crossed the Red Sea, it's not usual that a sea just divides and then dries up so that people can walk right across it. That was a miracle. Uh, when the sun stood still for about a day, that's a miracle. When healings happened of, of things like, uh, whether it was blindness or deafness or, or muteness or, uh, or, or leprosy or anything else along that, raising the dead. Usually when people are dead, they stay dead, right? At least until the resurrection. Uh, but when miracles occurred, the dead were raised. Those that were sick were healed, and not just healed, because if you cut your finger, are you going to heal? Of course. What was the difference between an ordinary healing, like you might do today, and a miraculous healing? It was instantaneous. That's right. Remember the story about uh, uh, Peter taking a swipe at, at the high priest's servant, cuts off his ear? Now, if we were going to fix that, what would we have to do? Emergency room, first of all, right? And then sew it back on. What's that? said go to a level one trauma center, have a plastic surgeon come in. There you go. That's, uh, but uh, lacking that in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's not a whole lot could, that you could do. You'd have to, and then, even then, it would be a while before that thing would heal up, right? So what did Jesus do? Picked it up off the ground, stuck it back on his head, rock and roll. You know, that's, that's all there was to it. Um, that's what a miracle is, the suspension of the laws of nature. Providence, on the other hand, is what? God's plan. God's plan kind of being worked out. And, and I kind of like the definition. It's not necessarily complete, but uh, providence is God working anonymously. I, I read that somewhere. It just really kind of stuck with me. Um, but it, it's God working in the world, and, and it is true, most assuredly true, that God is active in the world. It's just that it doesn't happen in a miraculous way anymore. Um, and so we wanted to kind of take a look at that, uh, the, the providence end of that, just a bit this evening. Uh, is God active in the world? And the answer is yes, but although it used to be miracle and prophecy, and providence, it is now by providence only, or providence alone today. And I think that's important to keep in mind, that God really is active. This is, in fact, the very reason why it is that we pray. Whenever we pray, when we are asking for God to, to sustain us uh, with food, clothing, and shelter, does God do that? Yep. When we ask that God end up healing us because, well... Our sister Frida is here. We've been praying for her pneumonia. Well, here she is. How did that happen? Well, certainly there might have been doctors involved and maybe some antibiotics and so forth. But after it's all said and done, who really has the power to heal? God does. God does. 
and so it is that, that we end up asking God for a lot of things. And when they occur, it's, it's really not... This may be saying it a little bit too much, using a little too much slang, but honestly, it's just not cool to have God do something and then kind of go, yeah, well, whatever. It just sort of happened. Because that's not, that's not what went on. When we prayed about something and things have turned out as we have asked that they might turn out, we need to recognize that it is God who has done this. Uh, because it could have turned out lots and lots of different ways. But because of the prayers that we have uttered, God did what was in our best interest. And as we've noted before, sometimes in our best interest, sometimes is no. Okay, In the very same sort of way that uh, if kids ask mom and dad, can we have ice cream for every, every dinner? This is so good. And mom and dad say, yeah, it's delicious, but no, we're not doing that. Why? Because it's not in our best interest, that's why. And there's some things that sometimes we ask for that really aren't in our best interest. We may want them awfully bad, but God loves us. And sometimes that may, means making hard decisions. God sometimes says no, despite how much we might want it. But I think the important thing to keep in mind is that God sees the long run. He sees the long picture. And he operates in our best interest always. But this is indeed why it is that we pray, because we do realize that God is operating in this world. Uh, God sometimes ends up working through people, like doctors and nurses, sometimes through circumstances, sometimes he works through nations and politics and coincidence, quote-unquote. What is coincidence? I'm not looking for a theological answer here. It's accidental. Yeah, we kind of think it just, it just sort of happened that way. Just accident, no one planned it, it just sort of happened that way. But in my observation, a lot of times... There's not that many coincidences. There's not that many accidents that occur. Sometimes there's an awful lot of really great things that just happen that are just a little bit too well planned for there not to be a plan behind it. You know, one of the things that we end up uh, talking about whenever it comes to, uh, for example, um, how do we know that God exists? Well, one of the proofs that God exists is just taking a look at the design of the world around us, right? Uh, anytime you have a design, you have to also look for a designer. Uh, Archaeology is an interest of mine, uh, and you know how they have started discovering all kinds of really cool and interesting um, Central America and South American Aztec and Inca and all these other different... You know how they're finding them? What they, they, they have a hard time finding it because there's so much jungle there and, and so much undergrowth and overgrowth and, and these, these tremendous uh, uh, tree canopies and so forth. But they, they started flying over with radar, and what they're discovering is, is that every once in a while, you end up finding a straight line. Anytime you ever find a straight line in the middle of the jungle, what can you presume? Man. That's made by man. There's a design there. And sometimes those straight lines end up intersecting with other straight lines. And sometimes they end up to some square-looking objects that sometimes end up being buildings, pyramids, or whatever. So they're finding all kinds of cool stuff because they're simply following this very simple idea of looking for finding a design and realizing there is a designer. So and I'm trying to pull this over to the fact that sometimes when things work out coincidentally so perfectly, what can we possibly assume? Maybe it's a God thing, after all. Maybe it's God in his, in his great providence working in our favor. So I think it's just really important, I think, for us to realize and know God really is working in this world. Uh, we may not know all the ways in which he's working. Sometimes, sometimes he works through bad people. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, but God works, and he is providing for his people, making sure that we're, we have everything that we need. Um, there's lots of examples that we can find in the, uh, in the Bible. For example, Hannah's prayer. Uh, Hannah was the mother of Samuel. Somebody tell me the story in brief about Samuel and Hannah. Hannah was barren. Hannah was barren. Uh, she actually had a rival. That her husband, Elkanah, had a, uh, another wife who had plenty of children. And there was this tremendous... Uh, um, 
I don't know, a competition, I guess you could say, between the two women. And Hannah was so upset about it that she goes, during one of the times in which the family was at the tabernacle, and she goes and prays this incredibly profound and heartfelt outpouring of prayer. And Eli ends up seeing her, and he ends up blessing her and so forth. But what happens after her prayer? Well, she had a son. She had a son? And she had made the deal. Was that by miracle? Yeah. Give me a son, and I will make sure and dedicate his life to service you. And he was a Nazarite from birth. Which means, by the way, that it wasn't just Samson that had long hair. It was also Samuel, because you couldn't cut your hair if you were a Nazarite. But anyway, that's beside the point. I'm full of all kinds of trivia that has no meaning at all. But anyway. So he was a Nazarite from birth. She had made that oath that if you will give me that son, then he will be a Nazarite from birth, and so on and so forth. Was the birth of Samuel miraculous? Did it somehow or the other violate the laws of nature? Well, no. Well, how did it happen then? It was providential. God answered her prayer. She kept her word on it, because she recognized that this was a God thing, right? We can take a look at Ruth's story. Is there any miracles that we can see in the book of Ruth? There's a whole lot of coincidences, but there's no miracle that we can find there. Remember the story of Ruth is that, is that uh, this fella from Bethlehem ends up taking his wife and two sons off into uh, Moab because there was kind of a famine locally uh, that he needed to feed his family, so he took off and went to Moab. Uh, while he was there, his two sons ended up marrying Moabite women. Um, after that happened, apparently the man himself died, and his two sons died, you might recall. Anything miraculous so far? Nothing miraculous so far. But as it turns out, uh, one, of the, one of the women, uh, whose name was Orpah, not Oprah, but Orpah, um, ends up, uh, uh, and Ruth, they, they, they want to support their mother-in-law, but, but their mother-in-law, Naomi, says, no, 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 I, uh, you girls go ahead and go home, go to your father's house, uh, I can't offer you any more sons, uh, would you really wait around if I, if I, if I could, really? Uh, so you just need to go home, find a husband, get married, have lots of children, God bless you, thank you for hanging out with me, etc. And Orpah goes home, but what does Ruth say? It's famous. I will go. Yeah. Don't entreat me to leave you or to, to return back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. She decides to go with her. So, anything miraculous so far? No. So they trek back to Bethlehem. And when they return back to Bethlehem, Naomi says, uh, don't call me Naomi anymore because that kind of means cheerful or blessed, that kind of thing. Call me Mara, which means bitter, bitter. Life has been bitter to me. But when they arrive, Ruth says, well, we got to eat. So maybe what I can do is I can go hang out around because that would be barley season. Maybe I can kind of go hang out and, and, and find somebody to be able to let me kind of follow behind the reapers. And so she does. Coincidentally, she ends up going where? Boaz's field. A close relative's field. And she begins to kind of go behind the harvesters and pick up kind of... You guys familiar with what the word glean means? Yeah. Okay, it means to kind of follow up and, and take up the leftovers. That's what she was doing. Uh, and ultimately and finally, of course, Boaz does kind of cast an eye her way. Uh, and after it's all said and done, Boaz and Ruth get married. And they have a grandson. I'm sorry, they have a son whose name is Obed. He has a son whose name is Jesse. And he has a son whose name is David. All of it so nicely coincidental. What are we looking at here? Providence of God. We're looking at the providence of God. The story of Esther is probably the most famous of all the providential stories, right? 
In the entire book of Esther, you know how many times the word God is used? Zero. And yet, there's so many cool coincidences that it is more than abundantly clear God was in charge of the whole thing from front to end, right? What happens, of course, is that uh, Xerxes has a, has a queen who, uh, in the middle of a party, and when, when the king says, I want you to display your beauty, we don't know exactly what that means, but whatever it was, she said, no way, Jose, it's not happening. And so uh, the king is upset. He happens to be humiliated. And so basically he demotes her. But now he needs a new queen. And so some of his advisors say, hey, we've got a really good idea. Why don't we have a beauty contest, right? And you can have your choice of all the most beautiful women in the entire nation of Persia. And just so happens that there's a young woman whose name is, anybody remember? Hadassah. And uh, ultimately she ends up becoming uh, Esther. But uh, in any case, uh, she is chosen. And she somehow or the other finds favor with the, one, of the, one of the eunuchs that's supposed to be looking after the, this new harem that the king has just developed. Uh, and the deal was going to be is that everyone in this harem was now going to spend a night with the king, and whoever ended up pleasing the king the most was going to be the new queen. Well, guess who pleased the queen the most? I'm sorry, the king the most? Esther. So she became, she became the new queen. Now it happens to be that her cousin, Mordecai, who has been kind of taking care of her all these years, raising her from a child, is so concerned about her that he's hanging out around the gate all the time. And while he's hanging around the gate, he happens to discover, by accident, a plot against the king. They were going to assassinate the king. He ends up reporting it, ultimately, to Esther, who reports it to the king. Uh, they end up finding the guards that were going to be trying to take or do this coup d'etat, uh, and uh, and they uh, they take care of they dispatch the men who are going to rebel, and uh, and the king has it written down in his in his log that uh, a fellow by the name of Mordecai reported this. I need to reward him someday, and he puts down the pen and goes on with his business. Well, it so happened that there was another fellow whose name is Haman who is what we would today call the Grand Vizier. He's kind of like Prime Minister, I guess you could say, of, of the Empire of Persia. His name is Haman. And Haman is a really proud guy. And because Mordecai would not bow down to everybody else, when, he, when, when Haman would come in the gate to, to the palace, to the, to the king's quarters, everybody bowed down to Haman except Mordecai. Why would Mordecai not do this? Yeah, it was a little bit too much like worship for Mordecai, so he wouldn't do it. But how did this end up affecting Haman? Ooh, he wasn't happy about that. So he ends up kind of plotting a little bit of a plot. He says, he comes to the king and says, Dear king, I have found that there is a people in your empire who don't really live according to the laws and customs of everybody else. In fact, you know, I just... They're such troublemakers. I really think it'd be a good idea if we could just like pull a genocide on them. Let's, let's exterminate these vermin. And so he says, uh, tell you what, here, here's what we can do. This is not going to cost you a thing. In fact, it may end up bringing a whole lot of money into your coffers. So here's the deal. Uh, why don't we make it open season on these troublemaking Jewish folks? And we will let people go ahead and it'll be open season on them. You can kill anybody you want. You can take all their, all their plunder. You can t do, do everything. Just you know, genocide them out. That's what we'll do. And the king goes, hmm, I really do hate troublemakers. So, okay, if you think so. So he signs the edict and it goes everywhere. Well, of course, Mordecai finds out about it too. And so he reports this to Esther and says, Esther, hey, what's... What's going on? You know what's happening here? And Esther says, no. Well, here's what's happening. Well, what do you want me to do about it? Well, you need to go to the king and talk to him about it. You need to persuade him not to do this. This is terrible for us. Uh, I don't know if I can do that or not. Why, why was she so reticent to help? 
See, the deal was in the Persian court is that if you came into the throne room without being asked to come in, you could lose your head right there on the spot. If the king did not extend his scepter to you, then the guards kind of had permission just to go ahead and dispatch you right there. So she said, look, I haven't been called into the king's presence in a long time. Um, if I just go in there unannounced and without any kind of a, <laughs> an appointment, uh, I could very easily be killed. Um, but Mordecai ends up answering him, well, you know, it's up to you, but don't think that you can escape any more than any of the rest of us Jews. You're not going to be able to escape. And you and your father's house will all be killed. Just telling you. And who knows, he goes on to say, who knows whether you didn't come to the throne for this very reason. Maybe that's why it is that you were chosen that way. And in saying that, of course, Mordecai is basically kind of expressing what? This is providence working. We see, of course, that ended up happening after it's all said and done. Because she does go into the king's presence. He offers the scepter. She comes and says, I've got a request. He says, half of my kingdom, whatever it is you want, Esther. And, and, he, and, and she says, well, I'd like to ask you and your buddy here, Haman, to come to dinner for with me, to have lunch with me. That'd be kind of nice. And so they, he says, well, oh, of course, of course, we'll, we'll do that. And so they, they have lunch. And, and he says, now, I know you didn't just ask me just for fun to have lunch with you. What is it you want, Esther? And she says, well, I'd like to ask you to come to dinner tomorrow night. He says, well, okay. And, and bring your friend Haman along with him, with you too. So Haman goes home, and, and oh, man, he's like walking on the air, right? Uh, I've, I've been invited by the queen herself to come to a private dinner party. Her and the king and me. Oh, this is awesome. Except, you know what? Despite the fact that I have been elevated to such an enormous degree, still, that Mordecai dude that won't bow down to me, I mean, it just irks me. And I can't enjoy all the, all the plaudits and all the, 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 the wonderful things that have happened to him because that's just in the back of my mind. It just bothered me so much. And he ends up telling that to some of his, uh, his, his friends and to his wife. And they all say, well, you know what? Here's what you need to do. Because you have such tremendous hatred for Mordecai, you need to haul off and build a really big high gallows upon which to hang Mordecai. Doesn't that make you feel better? And Haman says, yeah, maybe it will. So he builds a big, a big tall gallows. Well, the next morning, Mordecai goes in. And it happens to be that just that night before, the king had had a really hard time going to sleep that night. Now, if you're the king, what might be the most boring thing to put you to sleep there might be to do? Read. <laughs> Read some of the notes that you've taken. So he's going through the annals, going through the chronicles, and he runs across this, oh, you know what? Mordecai never did end up getting rewarded for what he did for me. Hmm. I'm going to take care of that tomorrow morning. So as soon as Haman comes in, and again, Haman's walking on air thinking, yeah, I'm going to get a chance to go to dinner with the king and the queen, and I'm building this tremendous high gallows, and everything's going to be great. And the king says, come on in here. i got a job for you. And Haman says, okay. And, and the king says, I need your advice. What is to be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor? Now, what's Haman thinking to himself? <laughs> well, must be me, right? Must be me. So, so here's what I would do. I would have the royal robes put on the man the king wishes to honor. And I would put him on the royal steed. And I would have all the, 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 the gilding and all the honors and so forth that goes along with all that stuff. Then I would have one of the highest officials that you've got lead the horse around all around town and say, thus it should be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. That would be a great honor to honor someone that you wanted to honor. Wow, the king says, what a great idea. Here's what I want you to do. You know Mordecai? I want you to go do that very thing for him. 
Well, and, you know, obviously Haman is like blown away by this. And the scripture says after he did what the king told him to do, the scripture says he goes home with his head covered. <laughs> He's in such deep mourning over the whole thing. He does go to dinner that night. And finally the king says, so what do you want, Esther? I know you want something. Just tell me what it is. Well, Esther says, you know, if it were just me, I'd go ahead and, and take the hit. But there is someone who has decided to try to kill my entire race. Well, who would that be, says the king. And she points the finger at Haman. Well, the king is like totally blown away. Ultimately and finally, to try to shorten the story because I'm going way too long on this, I get into Esther. I don't know why it is. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he ends up ultimately end up killing Haman, the bad guy, and they end up making it open season to all the Jews' enemies the day before it was supposed to be opening day on the Jews. So the Jews were able to get back at all of their enemies. And by the way, guess who got to be promoted to Grand Vizier? Mordecai. Providence? From front to end, right? From front to end. All these coincidences that really weren't coincidences at all. They were gone. What was that? So what did they do with that big gallows? Haman was hung on them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, that's the thing that kind of jumped up and bit Haman in the seat of the pants. Right there. It did. We could even go into Nehemiah's story, right? I'm not going to go into all that. Um, but again, a story that's just full of providence. In fact, looking at the larger picture even, when you take a look at the Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and Roman empires, and all the things that they contributed to the kingdom of God that came along during the Roman era, you can't you can't help but see clearly God's providence in doing everything possible to try to make it so the kingdom of God could spread as wide and far and fast as it possibly could. And indeed, because of the influences of all of these nations, the kingdom of God virtually exploded on the world scene. And it was all because of the providence of God. God working through kingdoms and kings and cultures and circumstances. God is indeed active in the world. And we might, perhaps, if you had a story or two to tell yourself, what kind of stories do you have to tell about providence in your life? I've got a story. But you've got stories, too. Moving here was a big thing of providence for me. Go ahead. When we first moved to Texas, um or we, when our house was being built, we, I had been staying with my uncle over here in McKinney, and he said, hey, I just bought this house next door as an investment. Why don't y'all stay there while your house is getting built so you can bring the family out here? So we did. And uh, while we were living there, my uncle ended up getting terminal cancer and passed away within months. Wow. But because we were right there, next door to this house, all my dad's brothers and sisters and family, they could come stay with us mm -hmm. and just be right there the whole time with, with him while he was passing away. Yeah. Yeah. It just was kind of really an amazing Set situation. of coincidences, you know, but really aren't coincidences. By moving here, Linda and I both felt like it was really God's providence working all the way through. When, I, when we thought about moving to Texas to be near my son, I didn't have any idea about preaching someplace. All my reputation, my entire career had been up in New England. Nobody in New England knew me. I'm sorry, everyone in New England knew me, but no one down here knew me. We ended up selling the house that we were living in for exactly the same amount of money that we bought the new house with. Um, the offer to come work here at Rock Hill came just right out of the blue, clear blue sky. I wasn't looking when you guys called. I don't know. There's so many circumstances that just really make me feel like being here is a matter of providence of God. Doug? Yeah. For those who may not know, your association with David Carter. Yeah. 
who came to the elder Peter and said, look, this guy's moving to Texas. If you don't snatch him up, somebody else is going to. <laughs> so it took just a few hours, yeah. maybe a couple of days. Yeah. One of the first things that come to mind, and this always struck me because I like to ask the young people in our class over there, what is the condition of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, mm. while the Egyptians were in bondage? You see in heaven or is he in hell? Oh, he's such a bad guy. I said, okay. The scriptures tell us very clearly that Pharaoh was created to show the glory of God. So if it's God's intent to show his glory by Pharaoh, then how can you say that Pharaoh doing the will of God is in heaven? And it's an unanswerable question. But but yeah, God does all kinds of things. He does. And, and yeah, I, uh, I'm kind of looking proof of that too, but maybe it's an edge. I mean, I lost this eye when I was two. And I've been called every kind of name you can imagine going into grade school because it turned white by the time I started school. Yeah. But I had three older brothers. So, I mean, if somebody said to me, well, what are you, a freak? They only did that once. <laughs> I mean, I had three older brothers, and I was a pretty good size kid, okay? So yeah. I was afraid of that. And, you know, didn't think anything about that, although my mother was a staunch member of the Lord's Church, and we as siblings talked about this later in life, that she had a unique ability without beating us over the head with the Bible. I grew up my entire life not wanting to disappoint her, and so as a good guy, that crossed over very easily to Christ, and, uh, and I'm sure I made a bunch of bonehead mistakes, and uh, every one of them is when I tried to do it myself. Yeah. Yeah. And it just follow the, you know, bits and pieces. And to go from, from that guy, and that's what I always love about Miss Isabel, she was one of those people along the way that, uh, with positive reinforcement, had let a, you know, going into high school and uh, God had me involved in the Holy Spirit. Sure. And sure. brought his failures and his successes. Yeah. All that said, I, I just really do think it's important for us to, to recognize that God is a lot more active than sometimes we give him credit for being. Uh, just because we don't see the literal hand of God moving in our life or some miracle that is a, um, a suspension of the laws of nature doesn't mean that God's not active. Uh, it simply means that God is working in, in ways that we can't even imagine. Uh, to put things in place, to put people in place, to put situations in our path making these so-called coincidences work out so beautifully in our lives. Um, it really is important, I think, to recognize that God is active uh, and to give him glory for that, um, that we wouldn't be where we are were it not for God. Yes, sir. I'll make it real quick. Uh, you know, I was talking about moving here to Texas in mm-hmm. 2003. My wife and I, we moved here and. Uh, we packed a U-Haul truck, and it broke down on us on the highway. Mm-hmm. Midnight. Great. So I get on the phone and call, and I'm praying. The Lord, help me, help me. We're out here in the dark. <laughs> Father, help me. Send us a truck or something. So I finally get in touch with a U-Haul. They said, well, we're sending your truck out. So the guy who brought the truck, he said, well, Sir, I brought you your truck. He said, but everything got to come off this truck and go into the other you <laughs> I said, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you come up there and tell my wife that? <laughs> he looked up there and he said, no, I don't think I'll. <laughs> 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 so we finally get the truck pulled to the, uh, to the hotel. Yeah. And we finally got into a repair shop. We got to fix it. We're on our way here. And we get to uh, Little Anna. That's where we were getting the house built at. Yeah. We get there after staying in hotels that I sold everything where we was moving from. We get there. We had, we had came here before. I said like I said like a week before. Fill out application for the house. When we get here, out of the hotel and everything, the guy tells me, I found some on your credit. You need $10,000. Now, he knew we had 
sold everything. He knew we had the money. Come to find out, I mean, I just got, I'm praying, my Lord, help me. this is not right. I sold everything. I got the truck packed. We broke down on the highway. We get here. Mm-hmm. We get here, and this guy tell me he needed $10,000. I wouldn't have it. All of a sudden, the guy told me, he said, well, just hold on one second, hold on. So all of a sudden, we go to the police. And somebody called the police because I got so mad. I didn't. I just, they called the police. Police told me, he said, look, I, what I'm going to do is, he said, I want to talk to you. I want to tell you what's going on. He said, this, these guys have been under investigation. And they've been ripping people off. They know a lot of people moving here into Texas. And they've been getting over on people. So he said, well, I'm just going to let y'all run the corner. So he let me out. So then all of a sudden, we got another house built out here down the street of Preston. Come to find out they were ripping people off. Hmm. And they shut them down. Wow. So God was the providence, active. Yeah, the providence of God yeah. really was with us. God was active. Blessing us on Indeed. the highway, with Indeed. the house, I sold everything. And man, it's, it's a blessing. It is. It is indeed. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to some other questions. <laughs> Can I get you to hand some up? Well, you know, Clark, one of the things that stands out in all of this that we think about God's problems and questions why some things happen, good or bad. It occurs to me that probably the best thing we can do is, regardless of whether it be good or bad at the time, that we give God the glory right. and just move on. That's right. Because we don't know. And some things that turn out to be really cruel and unusual fun, just like in Clarence's case, mm-hmm. it turns out just the way it's going to be, and it turns out it's to be better than we ever imagined. Yep. Our job is to be faithful. And That's what our job is. Right. And let God do what He does. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is a whole bunch of short answer questions, as it were, that were asked of me. I don't think they'll take too long. I doubt we'll get through this particular handout. We may get through the first one, maybe, uh, but we'll see. But the question that was asked was, why should I attend church services? I can worship God out in the wilderness by myself. I suppose this is probably a question that other people have, are asking uh, about why it is that uh, they should go to church. And uh, first of all, I think one of the first places you need to go is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Uh, and reading down through verse 25 or so. Notice here. And this is just that this isn't the only place where you can see that, that it, it's important to come to church. But, uh, and I use that term kind of loosely, of course, as you well know. Uh, but um, it's probably the most obvious of all of them. Notice he says here Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In essence, what is this passage saying? It's important to be in church for your well-being, your spiritual well-being. It is important to come. Our, what's that? We need each other. We need each other. We do. Um, this is, uh, you know, we, we live in a, in a world, our culture, our American culture in particular, is hyper-independent. You know what I'm trying to say? Um, independence is, is good. And there's, a lot of, there's a lot of societies and cultures that are very, you know, very knit together. You're not, uh, a sociological word I think is, do, do itism. 
But essentially what it means is that people are just not independent. You end up, whoever the patriarch or the matriarch of the family is, whatever they say, everyone just salutes it and that's what we do. But America is completely the other side. Who are the great heroes of our culture? John Wayne, Jeremiah Johnson, the cowboy that rides in on the horse all by himself, takes care of all the bad guys, and rides out of town all by himself, ruggedly independent. That's who we like to be. The problem with that is that that is also leaked off into our religion as well. Sometimes we end up thinking that I can be a Christian all by myself. I can be encouraged all by myself. I can worship God all by myself. Who needs you guys? And that is a large degree kind of what's going on in the world around us currently. That's part of the reason that, and it's not just the churches of Christ, just in case you were ever wondering. Across the nation, largely across the world, but especially in our nation, there's a whole lot of, when people ask, what religion are you? You know what, the, what so many people are saying these days? None. And they don't mean N-U-N, okay? They're meaning N-O-N-E, none. Um, why? Because they don't believe in God? Well, no, they'll tell you, I believe in God. I just don't belong to any particular church. Why? Not necessary. Why do I need church? I'll take Jesus, but you can keep the church. Thank you very much. An awful lot of the world thinks these days. Consequently, this is a pretty important question. It does, uh, it, it can be brought up really a great deal. Um, but one of the things that we'll notice in this particular passage is that attendance to the assembly of the church really is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not an option. He says, this is what you need to be doing. Um, and number two, it's worthwhile just noting what are the objectives of worship and assembly, because I think that also helps us to understand why it is that church needs to be a, a group thing and not just an independent Jeremiah Johnson kind of a thing. Um, consider for just a minute uh, the two-dimensional functions of these acts of worship, right? For example, what is, why do we sing? What does the scripture say? The scripture says we're to teach each other. That's uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. Right. We're in Ephesians 5, 19, it's all similar. Right. Now, of course, among other things that it ends up saying is that uh, is, is that we need to be also praising God. What does it mean to praise God? God, how great you are. You are glorious. And you know, just, just praising God for, for, his, uh, for his various uh, characteristics, the nature of God himself, his eternality, his, his, his omniscience, his omnipotence. Uh, God, look at the wonderful things that you've created around us. How great you are. Praise be to God. Uh, there's tons of psalms that just do nothing in the world except praise God. Okay, But the other part of it is, as you were pointing out, Burley, is to teach and admonish one another. The psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, what that is saying about what it is that we do in worship is that it's kind of two-dimensional, right? One of them ends up aiming at God. The other is aimed where? At us. And part of the, isn't it true that whenever we've got, especially a, a good attendance here on a Sunday morning, uh, and everyone is singing, I don't know, there is a God, he is, how does that make you feel? Wahoo, that's great, it's so encouraging, right? And that's kind of the point. Not only that, in terms of encouragement, we even teach each other whenever we're doing things like that. I don't know if you've ever done this before. You really ought to. Go through the hymn book and find it, because there are some really cool hymns in our hymn book that have some pretty heavy theology in them. Really kind of make you think about things. That's part of the teaching aspect of it. Now, unfortunately, sometimes we end up getting a little bit too wound up around the axle on how does it sound, and am I harmonizing correctly, and 
You know, is, is the song leader going too slow or too fast or whatever else it might be? We're really be t- paying attention to the words, but if we're paying attention to the words, what are we doing for ourselves? We're teaching ourselves. And in fact, everyone around us is teaching us. That's what the whole point is. How about prayer? What's the two-dimensional part of prayer? We pray for each other. Yeah. Not only are we praying to God with regard to, again, praise about who he is, but we also are to be interceding for each other. That's kind of the reason why it is that, for example, Burley, a lot of times, I I assume you're bringing up a bulletin sometimes whenever you're listing absolutely everyone that's on our prayer list, but there's a good reason for that. Why would we do that? Because it's a part of intercessory prayer. And by the way, there's also, the scripture says, a great deal of power in corporate prayer, right? And the idea basically, well, I mean, there's there's this this, uh, this story in, in, is it Acts chapter uh, 4, I believe it is, where where Peter and John just got released and they come back to the, to the church and tell them everything that went on and they end up praying. And remember what happened after they prayed? The earth was shaken. Scripture didn't mention that just because it wanted to report an earthquake. It wanted to report there was something special that was going on. And it does make a difference. Where two or three, you know, this this passage where it says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in their midst. What's the larger context of that? It's kind of talking a little bit about discipline, but it's talking about how it is that we need to be praying because in, in corporate because where two or three are gathered together in my name, they're mine in their midst. There's something in corporate prayer. Sometimes illustrated this way, if one kid comes up to dad and says, hey, can we go get ice cream? Maybe he says, eh, maybe. If the entire family comes up and says, hey, dad, can we go have ice cream? Now what? We're probably doing ice cream. Okay. Because there's power in corporate prayer. How about the preaching? Can you get everything you need from just reading the Bible on your own out in the middle of nowhere? Why? Well, if the skeeter that bites you isn't going to be going off saying there's power in the blood. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. I like that. That was, that was all right. <laughs> power in that blood. Anyway. So, yeah. Um, but... You know, it, it, it's sort of the, the same. There, there's a there's a little bit of a parallel uh, between preaching and, and counseling. Um, why do people go to counselors, psychological counselors? I know what my feelings are, so why do I need a counselor? I need someone objective on the outside that can tell me, you know, you're feeling this way, but no, don't do that because that's not a good idea. Um, you need someone outside objective to point out the things that you need to correct. And in a similar sort of way, if I'm just reading the Bible on my own, I can get a lot of good stuff on, on my own. That's true. But it's also kind of good to hear somebody else's point of view and to be encouraged to do the right thing. Because he's objective. He's outside of where you are. It's so easy, isn't it, to justify ourselves and to rationalize things away? I'm pretty good at it. I don't know about you. Sometimes I need someone to say, hey, moron, wake up and smell the coffee. Come on. I need that. Everyone needs that. Um, so preaching even has a kind of a corporate uh, sort of a thing to it. How about communion? What are we doing in communion? Remembering. Exactly. We're communing with the Lord, but we're also communing with one another. And if you don't really believe that, just take a look at, at what uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11 both end up talking about. It talks about sharing the bread. And as we end up sharing the bread, we're to remember that we are one loaf, the scripture says. And whenever it is that we partake of the cup, it says that we are partaking of the cup, which is the new covenant in my blood. Covenant is all about family. And when we're remembering that we're in covenant with God, we're remembering we're in covenant with God. But if I'm in covenant with God, and she's in covenant with God, and he's in covenant with God, what does that make us all? Family. And we're to be remembering each other. 
as well whenever we're partaking of communion and giving. Again, that's a corporate and communal thing. If you're all by yourself in the wilderness, who, what are you going to give to, right? So. The point very simply is, is that we come together not just to praise God. That's a part of it. That vertical part of worship is definitely there. But there's also this horizontal aspect that we need to be sure not to ignore. Uh, and people that would end up saying, why should I attend worship service so I can worship God in the wilderness by myself, have ignored the horizontal part of it. And maybe we might think, I'm strong enough, I don't need them. What's the appropriate answer there? Maybe they need you if you're that strong. Maybe you can help somebody else. Maybe you can help somebody else. Well, I can go on for another half hour, so I'm going to stop here. But, uh, but we'll continue with this next time about the same place. But I'm going to go off into uh, kind of devotional mode, I suppose, and just, just basically call us all to remembrance again, kind of looking back on the idea of, of providence. It is important for us to keep in mind just uh, how much God really is active in our lives. And not just to recognize it, but to be thankful for it. And to live thankful lives because of it. You know how you live a thankful life? By being obedient. Doing what the Lord says. This evening then, if as a Christian, in your life you've perhaps not been living quite as thankfully as you should. Maybe there have been things in your life that you are doing that you really do need to stop. We encourage you to do that, to make that decision now in your heart to repent. And this evening, if it happens to be that you are not yet a Christian, we encourage you to place your faith in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess Him as Lord, and be baptized in Christ. This evening, then, if you need to respond to God's generous call, would you please come forward while we stand and sing together?